Hello, welcome to the Townsend's YouTube channel. My name is Ryan Kerr, and today we have Carol Jarbo, who is a longtime friend and someone who we've done a lot of videos with. Thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Thank you for asking me again. Absolutely. I'm so interested in, well, number one, overall your research, but this last four years that you've been spending looking at colonial survival jobs, it's just so intriguing, and I can't wait to talk about it today. Oh, good. Me too. Ask away. So to start off, Carol and her husband, Frank, have built a traveling museum that's going around to different reenacting events where they are educating families, children, whoever comes by on survival jobs that were happening in the colonies for people that were trying their best to stay out, out of, of the, the poor, poor house. house right. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's get into this first with some jobs that were maybe uh, more accessible or the ones that people were quicker to g gravitate towards if that situation arose. Okay. In this museum that we have, um, there are 17 jobs that people did to stay out of the poorhouse, like we said. And um, they're, out of all 17, there are only three that are actually hired jobs where you would actually go in and apply per se. But that's one of the things that, that we have to understand about this time period is you just didn't go to a store and put it in an application and hope that they called you back mm. into work. So the rest of these jobs are all what we call entrepreneurial jobs. They're things that people could just go right out and start on their own because they're gonna need to be able to do that. Once you've lost your main breadwinning job, you're not usually gonna have enough money to put back to hold you out for several weeks and there's definitely no government programs that's mm -hmm. gonna pay you uh, until you find a job. So these entrepreneurial jobs were jobs that you could just start out on your own. And uh, the museum is set up in such a way that as you go through, you can see uh, the different options that you would have. Now, one of the things about this museum I'd really like to point out is that it's not geared toward one uh, person or type of person. Uh, most of these jobs were done by children. Mm. All of the jobs but two were done by women. And of course, men were across the board. Uh, some of them could do all the jobs and some of them could only do part of the jobs, depending on what happened to them uh, to cause them to be into this situation. Okay. So when, you're, when I'm talking about them, remember that this is, you've got children as young as three, four, and five years old doing these jobs. Mm -hmm. okay? okay, some of them, some of them. Let me talk about the hired jobs first. Okay. Uh, one of the ones that I thought was the most frustrating that is still going on today uh, is called a stevedore. Uh, a stevedore was the person who went and helped to load and unload the ships that came in to the docks. So this is going to be a, a, a job that's only going to happen in the, in the places where there's harbors. Um, but the frustrating part of it was is that you would have to get up in the morning about 3 or 4 o'clock and go down to the wharf and stand there with ever how many men are also hoping to be a stevedore that day. And you would have to wait to see if a ship needed to be loaded or unloaded and whether they would choose you to do the job. Right. So they would literally, the, the owners would come out and say, okay, you and you and you and you and the rest of you know. And so there you would stand. And you would, these men had to stand there all day long waiting and hoping mm -hmm. that they might get chosen to do a job. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was no guarantee that you had money coming in. I think in today's <coughs> day, this job is still going on, but I think they call them longshoremen at this point. And now it's a more governed job, a more hired job, rather than just picking. But, um, but you can imagine going down to the wharf and standing there with X amount of other men, not knowing if you're going to get picked or not, and right. whether or not you're going to go home with anything in your pocket. And the whole time you're thinking, well, I could be doing this other job, but if I did that, right. then I wouldn't be, be here. Be here. If, yeah, right. Yeah. It paid more money, but only if you got hired. I think that would be incredibly frustrating. Yeah, absolutely. So that was the first hired job. What's the second hired job? Well, let's talk about another hired job um, that was called the Harbor Dredger. And in the city of Baltimore, the way the streets ran, anytime it rained or snowed, everything got washed down into the harbor. Mm -hmm. So all the garbage that was being thrown out, all the animal uh, refuge, uh, everything got washed into the harbor and as it's being washed into the harbor it's raising the bottom of the harbor up right. so the boats can't get in. There were two brothers that owned a flour mill there and they could not get their boats in close enough, their ships, to unload the product that they needed in order to be able to run their flour mill. So they came up with a system of digging out the silt and the garbage out of that 
water in order to keep it low enough and the mm. water high enough to be able to bring it in. And they developed a machine that had a great big wheel on it where horses would run it round and round. And they hired men uh, to go out and stand next to the floating barge that was next to the wheel. And their job was to shovel out all of this stuff that yeah. had washed down into or onto the top of the barge. Now, that doesn't sound so bad until you realize that in the heat of the summer, the smell of that silt and the stuff that you're dredging out, which could get really nasty, uh, you're standing in thigh deep water trying to shovel that out, but it went year round. And in the winter, you're standing oh, wow. in freezing water trying mm -hmm. to do the same thing. The good news was, if you're a drinking person, is that in the winter time, as soon as it got cold, they give you uh, a dram of rum every day to help keep you warm. So that always drew people sure. in. Um, but the job was so hard and it was so nasty that the average time that one person would work on that particular job was three days. Oh, wow. Three days. So yeah. I don't know if I told you this, but we had a a picture study in the in the Nutmeg Tavern live stream where we're pretty sure that a painting of this popped up. I oh. don't know if you saw that, no, but, or I if we talked that. about it. But we were looking at it, and all of a sudden it clicked. It was like I think that's what Carol was talking about. Yes, and the interesting thing to me about this is that, of course, the job is still going on today. There are still harbor dredgers out there, although they're not putting men down in the water shoveling it out, but the machines that they came up with uh, developed into a big scoop and then it came into something that sucks it up. The two brothers with the flour mill that actually started all this quit making flour and started making dredging machines oh, really? and they still make them today. Wow. It's the same company. That's, that's nuts. That's two of the paid jobs. What's the third one? The third one, let's go to the women. Um, one of the biggest problems that you have here in the colonies as far as women who are poor are widows and they usually have small children and that stops them from being able to go out and do any kind of a job outside of where they are. As we get into the latter part of the 1700s, um, rather than going to a tailor to have your clothes made, they're beginning to find out that they can make money, especially for the sailors, who are only in town a very short period of time. If they go ahead and make their clothes ahead of time and set them up so that when the sailor comes in to the, to the dock, he can come off and buy what he needs ready-made and then be able to leave again. And so you have these slop shops. Mm -hmm. Slops, of course, being the sailor's clothing uh, that begin to spring up. Well, the people that run the slop shops don't want to have to pay a skilled tailor to do the sewing. So they begin to hire these widows who are homebound in their little rooms with the small children to do the sewing for them. And then they finish them once they get back to the shop. So these slop shop sewers uh, are scattered everywhere up and down the coastline um, where these poor women are working 16 hours a day sewing these pieces of garments together in order for the slop shop to be able to sell them. They make a pittance. In fact, they mm. said that most of them could not even make enough money to survive working 16 hours a day every day. Uh, that's how little they paid them. But it was a job and it was something they could do to try and hold on. Along with that, we also discover that it's a lot cheaper to make shoes ready-made than it is necessarily to go to a, a shoemaker and have him made specially to your feet. Not everybody can afford that. So what do you do with the poor people who can't afford to go somewhere and have their shoes made special? Well, you just make a whole bunch of them. But in order to hire the people to make shoes like that, who wants to pay these professionals to make shoes that poor people are going to buy? Mm. So now we are cutting out the tops, the leather tops of the shoes, and we're sending them to the widows, again, that are called shoe binders. And their job is to sew the tops together, the leather uppers, send them back to the shop where they're put on to the soles uh, by the professionals. Mm. So you have shoe binding and you have slop shop makers that up and down the coast and in all the towns that are making these ready-made things, if you want to call them, and they are the ones where our sweatshop term comes from. Mm. Now, these women, these widows, are, are doing this to try to make a living. What might their children be doing to help bring in money for the family? Oh, we'll talk about some of the children's jobs. Um, like I said, you have children as young as three and four years old that are going out and having to work. 
Uh, one of the things we like to tell people is there was no childhood at this period of time unless mm -hmm. you were very wealthy. Um, your child, by the time they are six or seven years old, is a viable working person in your family and you count on the money they can bring in. But there are things that even younger children could do. One of the jobs that we have is called a peer finder. And that is a job where uh, young children, particularly, and very elderly people would go around and pick up dog feces. You've got a lot of stray dogs running everywhere, so they would go and pick up dog feces and take it to the tanners. And the tanners would use that in order to soften and tan their hides. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, particularly, they're looking for uh, feces that is set out a little bit that gets that kind of gray crust on the top. That gray crust is nitrates. And so there, the reason it's called pure is because there were people who tried to take other feces or other fake things, even mud, and roll them in uh, powder <laughs> or ground up uh, gravel to get that gray look on the top and then they would put them in a bucket and turn them in and the tanners would say, we need the pure stuff. We've got to have the pure stuff. So that's where the term pure finder came from. I see. Uh, but that was a job. You could get six pence for a bucket full and that was enough money to eat and lay down somewhere. So that was a fairly viable job, as long as you didn't mind walking the city looking for the dogs. I don't think I'd want to be the person that had to check to make sure it was real. No. Like buying into a piece of fool's gold. <laughs> yeah, don't think I want to do that either. That would be a rough <laughs> job, but, but you have so many children that do that job because it was easy. I mean, mm -hmm. you give the little child a bucket and tell him to go out and look for, for dogs. So that's what they would do. Let's see, another job that was done by children, in, in specifically children, is that scavenging job. Uh, the scavengers, there is no garbage collection at this period of time. Garbage is being poured into the streets. Um, Benjamin Franklin talks about how it's big piles on the corners of his town in Philadelphia. Scavengers were people that would go through the garbage, fight off the dogs and the cats and the pigs that ran loose who were eating the, uh, the vegetable material, mm -hmm. and uh, pick through and look for things that could be recycled and sold to someone else. Uh, and you have people of all ages doing that, uh, sitting around these big piles of gar garbage and just digging through, looking for things that could be resold, like bones, uh, pieces of cloth, um, you have uh, uh, metal, anything of metal was worth money that could be taken to the metalsmiths and um, melted down and made into little tin soldiers or, or other mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so you've got, a, you've got a number of things, uh, old pieces, scraps of leather. Uh, those little scraps of leather that got thrown out all the time, they would take those to the shoemakers and they would stitch that all together and make uh, shoes for the poor people mm -hmm. out of those. So scavenging was a job that anybody of any age could do once they learned what they had to look for in there. So earlier we were talking about, was it a rag collector? A rag picker. A rag picker, okay, mm -hmm. what's that? A rag picker you see done mo mainly by women at first, but the men get involved in this before very long. Rag pickers, of course you, you do remember at this period of time that our paper is being made of cloth. It's, right. it's a linen paper. Right. So the paper manufacturers were always asking for people to bring their old rags in or old thread stockings or wool pieces or um, the, the binding sits at the end of the uh, weaving on the loom oh, that where okay. you cut it off and yeah. I can't remember what they're called. Mm -hmm. um, but those kind of things would be brought in and they would soak it in water and, and take it down to the threads and then make, them, make it into paper. So rag pickers were women, for the most part, who went around and collected rags from houses, uh, from garbage, um, if they were, they could scavenge for those type of things, or the scavengers could actually sell them to the rag pickers and send it on. Um, but this was very, very important in order to be able to make paper, particularly during the wars, in, in, of all the wars in the Revolution was very, very important. We were getting a lot of our paper from England. And when that got stopped because of the revolution, we were desperate in order to get paper, not only to write things on, but also to make the gun cartridges that the soldiers had to use in order to be able to load their, their rifles right. to be able to shoot, their guns to be able to shoot. So that, the price of rags tripled through that period of time and the rag makers actually did fairly well through that time. The interesting thing about rag pickers is that that job is going to go all the way up until about the 1960s, the early 1960s. And I have many, many people that come through the museum that say they remember being at their grandmother's house 
and hearing the ragmen come to the door and call out old rags, old rags, new papers, old iron, that, that happened through that period of time. The rag pickers are actually going to turn into what we call peddlers because okay. uh, eventually they're going to start trading for old iron and rags and things like that. They're going to trade things to well, you. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Was there any, did rags have value for the homeowner? Did they purchase the rags or did they? Just Generally, trade? they just threw them away. Okay. Generally, they just threw them away. And one thing about the rag picking job that was not fun was that you had to take all those rags home at night and wash them before you could take them and turn them in. Okay. White rags brought more money than colored rags. Of course, that makes sense. Um, but if most of the rags you're going to get are going to be small pieces and they're going to be greasy and they're going to be dirty. And you're going to have to wash all of that out before you turn them in or you won't make much money. So a lot of these jobs have to deal with going through the garbage in a city or going door to door in close proximity, but eventually you're going to have worked an area and probably have to spread out a little bit of right. the area that you're working. So a lot of these jobs, I'm assuming people would walk for miles before they could even get to work. Right, right. That's true. Let's talk about an ash collector really quick. Okay, ashes here in the colonies were worth a lot of money because you take ashes and boil them down and make potash and that's used as fertilizer. Now we didn't need it quite so much here because we had, well our land was new and so we really weren't fertilizing that much at the beginning. Mm. But England who had used up all their trees was frantic for it because they were having to fertilize their land. So potash was worth a lot of money to export it out. So that made ashes worth a lot of money. But how do you get ashes? Well, you can go door to door, house to house, but mainly you had to go out into the countryside to where people were using fires, cooking like we mm -hmm. have a fire here, uh, who were cutting down trees on their property and, and cooking and using the fires for all kinds of different things. The ash collectors, they said, that walked every day, generally walked about 15 miles. Oh, wow. That was their route. Okay a 15 mile route in order to pick up ashes. And just like anything else, you had a route that you did where they expected you to come by every okay. couple of days. So they you know? anticipated it. So they anticipated okay. that. But you would do different routes on different days, you know, and make your circuit in order to be able to get enough ashes to take back to sell. There are okay. ads in the Gazette that even said that the from the potash companies that were begging for 10,000 uh, bushels of ashes as quickly as somebody could get them there. That's how sought after it was. And I have read that the farmers could cut down their trees, burn them, and sell the ash and make more money than anything else that they could grow on the farm. I have heard that at, at times that it was, it was uh, the best thing a farmer could do is just burn a tree and sell the ash. And sell the ash. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you've got these different routes, right? Uh -huh. That you're going through and you're probably, it's cyclical. Mm -hmm. So what happens when somebody else starts trying to take over or your route or, or beat you to like were there turf issues? Yes there were turf issues a lot of the different jobs had turf issues in fact I've read an account by a woman who was a pure finder and she had been a pure finder for like 25 years and she said that when she started she could get a sixpence a bucket very easily but now there were so many people doing it so many orphan children and so many um, invalid men that were doing that that she could hardly make a sixpence a day. Oh, wow. Well. Absolutely none of these jobs sound desirable, but I know that there are some that are even less desirable than what we've talked about so far. That's right. We've kind of talked about the ones that aren't so bad at the top, but there were some that just went down, 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 down. Let's talk about those real quick. Um, how about a leech collector? The country women did this for the most part. Uh, they would walk into places where leeches were and then allow them to adhere to their legs and then uh, come out and take them off and put them in little kegs and take them and sell them to the medical doctors. Uh, the only thing bad about that, that doesn't sound so bad, you know, you'd say, ah, I get that leech off. You had to let them finish eating before you could pull them off. Oh, really? Okay. Because you're gonna hurt their mouths if you just jerk them off. So they've gotta finish sucking whatever they're gonna suck before you can take them off and put them in your keg. So when you think about catching 25 or 30 of those a day, you're gonna stay anemic all the time oh. if you're doing that on a daily basis. So that was the danger of that job and uh, illnesses were very prevalent among the women who did this. I wouldn't have thought about 
letting it finish eating. That's, you had to let that's it the caveat that yeah. changes everything. Yeah, that makes it a whole lot worse. Makes it a whole lot worse. Okay. Um, how about a bone grubber? Let's talk about that. One of the things I talked about as a scavenger that they could dig through the garbage and look for were bones. Um, but there were people who were specifically bone grubbers. And their job was to go through the garbage and look for bones, to go through uh, any place that would have thrown out bones mm -hmm. um, behind the inns, the taverns, where they were eating. Uh, they would go by the slaughterhouses and ask for the bones. And then they would take them and sell them to the bakers to use ground up as a filler for their bread. Now, bone flour, I have some. It looks exactly like flour. You really can't tell a difference. Mm -hmm. But the bakers you see were held by law in different places they were at, and I know you all have talked about this before on Townsend's. They were held very strictly to what size of loaf they could have and how much it could sell for. So if your price of wheat went up, you just had to take a hit and that's when they would start using fillers right. for their breads. Uh, bone was tasteless. Um, it was white when you boiled them out and bleached them out and ground them down. So when you've read Jack and the Beanstalk and that giant says, fee fi fo fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman, be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. He was talking the truth yeah. because that's what was going on at that time. It's not something he just made up. It's uh, when you, you don't imagine today that bread would be one of the most regulated things in society, but no. it was. And bakers were put in such a hard position sometimes, depending on how the crops were doing, that they experimented. They did. In order to be able to keep the price the same, sometimes they had to put a little something else in there to make that wheat stretch a little bit further. <laughs> so, so what is the, in your opinion, the lowest of the jobs that you've come across so far? Probably the one that I see people the most upset about when they come through and read it is the night soil men or women. It was a both jobs. Usually it was a group of four people their job was to come at night and clean out your uh, outhouses or your cesspools, wherever your waste was going to. Uh, you had one fellow that would go down in the hole. His job was to stand down there and shovel into the big bucket that number two fellow would pull back up. And then he would dump it into a very large bucket or, or a keg. And uh, the two people who were carrying that would put it on a, uh, usually they put it on like a, uh, a pole and held it on their shoulders and they would take it to the fertilizer plant and it would be used as fertilizer the next day. Um, that job was probably the most dangerous job because you're down in there with every kind of disease that can mm -hmm. possibly go by, not to mention the methane gas that usually happened down in that area. These were not shallow, they were fairly deep. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have records of men who would go down one night into, a, into a, uh, an outhouse to dig it out and die immediately. And the second fellow would try to go down to get him out and he would die. Uh, so it was a dangerous, year. It said that generally the men that did the, the down job and the one who was at the top and they switched out uh, were heavy drinkers. And you can imagine <laughs> that it would probably take something like that to brace you to make you want to even get out in there to begin with. So, but that, that job probably didn't pay any more than any of these others. No, it was just no, about no. availability. It was just about availability. And you got money from the fertilizer plant for what you took as well as being paid to go down and do the job. Okay. And what about chamber lye? Is that that, that was being something? collected okay. also. Chamber lye was being collected. That was not quite as bad a job. And I, I like to say that that was kind of a own your own business kind of job because the chamber lye, which of course was the urine that came out of the chamber pots, was collected in the mornings by the person who was in charge. And he would take it back to his area and spread it out and let it sit out because after two weeks it turns into a very strong ammonia. And once it makes that change, you have several different groups of people who use it. You have gunpowder makers that use it. You've got the tanners that used it. You had the people who dye wool. Urine was very heavily used as a mordant to get the color to stick to the wool. In fact, it was the best. Um, the people that are doing uh, indigo 
would mm -hmm. use urine as an indigo pit in order to get the flower to let go of the blue and, and make that. The farmers used it. They would soak their wheat seed in it in the spring to kill the fungus that was on it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you have multiple, and the laundresses, of course, uh, how could I forget that, um, would use that as bleach. So you have multiple uses. So once you've collected that chamber lye, you kind of owned your own business and you could sell it to different people. And I like to tell people it was probably one of the better paying jobs. Mm. Okay. As you were going through and developing this museum, you would bounce different jobs off of John and I sometimes when we got to see you. And one of the interesting ones that I'm sure is not cute, but almost seemed cute was, is, is it called a squirrel c collector? It's a baby squirrel collector. Okay. Yes. A pet, a pet squirrel collector. Apparently, uh, according to the research, Little gray squirrels and little flying squirrels were considered the best pet for children in the colonies. Uh, they were so sought after that there was a running business in catching baby squirrels and bringing them to the market and selling them for pets. So you actually had young boys and young men who would climb trees during the breeding season of, of the squirrels or when they would have their babies and take the babies out of the nests and then bring them back to the market to sell. Now, there was a good market for that. They were easy to sell because they were very highly sought after by the wealthy children. Uh, in fact, Benjamin Franklin even wrote his wife while he was in England and asked her to go to the market and pick up several gray squirrel babies and ship them over to him because he wanted to give them as gifts to the children oh, wow. of the family that he was staying with. Uh, the only thing is about that job is it's seasonal. Mm. Only twice a year, so you'd have to have a fallback the rest of the time. But I've heard that you can make pretty good money selling those baby squirrels. Right. At Townsend's, we are interested in details about history that you don't hear in school mm -hmm. when you're growing up. Uh, it's funny how we can just be so fixated on a detail of what somebody wrote about in a journal and just not get past that until we experience it. Right. I know that you think about history in a very similar way where you're trying to look at nitty gritty details. You're trying to look at things that people don't know about. Right. And, and then you just dive into that research. Right, right. I think it's important sometimes in order for us to look at history, to build a community uh, and be able to look at the culture across the board. And, and sometimes we get fixated on one place or another. But when you get into these, these little areas like you, you all like to do and like I like to do, where you're going down to the people that are maybe not being talked about quite as much or the areas that are not as well known, that you open up a whole new door to the culture of the time mm -hmm. and what was happening. Right. Yeah, and that is the, the, the small details are where you find culture. Absolutely. Right? I mean, everybody knows things about rich famous people. Oh right. But rich famous people are few and far between. But you don't know about the person who stood on the corner with their hand out. Right. right. So uh, probably the best way for people if they want to see the museum or if they want to meet you in person is to go to historical reenactment. Right. right. And luckily you and your husband have built a new tool that is helping people find reenactment. Right. We have a place called reenactingschedule.org and that is a place that the events are uh, putting up their events, the dates, the times, where they are. Um, and you can go there and see what might be in your area or coming up in your area and the dates that are coming up if you have a free weekend. Uh, just go to reenactingschedule.org and see what might be there. Uh, and if you're an event coordinator, we would love for you to come and put your event on there uh, so that next year we can have even more out on there than we did this year. So there are several live events already on that website. It's one of the better looking websites I've seen in a long time. Go check that out. And Carol, thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, really thank you for it. asking me. Absolutely.